good afternoon everyone <clears throat> i'm sure um, you all had your lunch and um, the room is dark now so you probably all like to sleep uh, i would like to just show you this presentation and talk about um, the concept of being an expert i don't claim myself being an expert i think i still have a lot to learn but um, i would share with you uh, a general concept of what I think makes an expert. And then hopefully I show you some data um, and give you some idea of what do you really need to become an expert in something you do. Is uh, everybody awake in the room now? Who do you call expert? I don't know how many of you in the room recognize this guy. Uh, he's Sergei Bubka, who was from Ukraine, former USSR. When I was a little boy and growing up, I used to follow athletics. I don't look like an athlete now, but when I was young, I used to run and I used to do lots of things. He's the only guy who actually have managed to go above six meters in pole vault. He broke 17 times his own world record. And not a single person after him had been able to go above six meters. So you could say that um, he was an expert in what he did safely. Is that right? Probably it is. Then if I show you this picture, some of you might know him. He's a very famous golf player. His name is Tiger Woods. And he became a, a phenomenal success in the world of golf and kept things very, very simple up to the point before he had other affairs outside golf and all the problems started. We are surgeons and some of you might recognize this name or this face. This is Professor Bill Heal, who is the father of open total mesorectal excision concept. In my view, he is the single most important person who have made the biggest contribution to rectal cancer treatment in the last century. This is my personal view. Because he was not only able to demonstrate what he did and did very well, he was able to teach people what he genuinely thought was the good way to do it. So he was really an expert in what to do. So when each of these people were individually asked by different people, you know, I had a, a privilege of working with Bill Heal. I know him still as my teacher and mentor. When each one of these persons were asked individually, you know, what makes them what they are? You know, what makes them so good in what they do? You know, when somebody asked Sergei Bubka, you know, why you are so good? Why you can go on six meter? Are you not afraid of this pole that hangs around? And his answer was that I never look at the pole that I have to clear. I always look slightly above the pole where I have to go. And when Tiger Wood was asked that, how come you are able to put the golf ball from hundreds of yards into the little pole and you have trees, you have lakes, sands, whatever. He says, I never see any of that. All I see is the hole where this ball has to go. And when you talk to Bill Heal, he never saw any arrogant pillars. He never saw any extra anatomical variation. All he see is air around the rectum and he keeps doing surgery around the rectum in the air and he usually gets to the end. So the idea really is, what I'm trying to say is expert are the person who makes things look very easy. They have very simple solution to difficult problems. I'll come back to surgery now and I would say within the surgery, the expert is the person who have got consistent and standardized technique of doing it, who have recognizable patterns for trainees. So people, are, people who train with an expert are able to see what they are being taught and they can recognize it. They have reproducible surgical techniques. So there's no point somebody coming to the big meeting and doing a nice operation and then nobody else can do it. What's the point of doing it? The real trick is that this operation can be done by anybody sitting in the audience with time, training and dedication. So in many ways, if you have all this, then you have predictable, good clinical outcome. Making things look very simple. Now if I ask you that this is a picture of Moscow, some of you may agree with it, others might say that this is a picture of Oxford, you know, just outside Oxford in England. There are similar chimneys and they look like this in the evening. I can show you and ask you, is this the picture of Moscow? 
and you say maybe, maybe not, maybe this is St. Petersburg, you know, in a summer day when uh, Alexei Khrushchev have sent me this picture from his house. But if I show you this and ask you, is this Moscow, then everybody would say, yes, it is Moscow, because we recognize the pattern. You know, we are familiar with what we're looking at, and our brain processes the information very quickly. And that is really a key in training program, when you want to train someone, you want to make somebody better, you want to make them familiar with the same pattern over and over and over again until it becomes engraved in their brain. Does any of you uh, know the rule of 10,000 hours? If not, there is a, a book that I read. I am, I'm a huge fan of finding out what makes people good at what they do. And there is a very f important book written by a table tennis player in England. It's called Bounce. And there is a theory that if you really want to become good at something, then you should need to practice it for 10,000 hours or 10 years. Thank you. The idea really is that if you do things for 10,000 hours in a consistent manner, you will become really good at what you do. And this has been proved in a number of ways. You know, if you, if you look through history, there are people who became really good at something. <laughs> so in 1970s, they did an experiment. They followed a group of 100 children who were learning music. And what they did was they asked the teacher, what are the predicted grades? What do they think certain people would get to? And people were given, you know, this will become excellent piano player, this will become ordinary, this would become this. So have different sort of assessment for each pupil. And then these people were left alone and then they went 10 years after that to find out where they were. And some had become international piano players, violin, concerts, some were doing national level event and some of them like me perhaps were just playing in the local pub. And it has absolute no correlation to what the teacher predicted 10 years ago. The only thing that was constant was number of hours each one of them actually used to practice in the last 10 years. So people who were playing piano and violin and, and guitar at the top world level, they on average have done 10,000 hours of practice. So the point I'm trying to make is that there is a concept that there is no such thing as talent. There is talent in all of us in this room to do what we want to do. The question really is what price we are willing to pay to achieve that level. And that's when individual limitation comes in, individual excuses come in, sometimes the family come in the way, sometimes instruments come in the way, sometimes education come in the way. But the reality is that most people can achieve, which anybody can achieve with dedication and time. So this was my personal view. Now I just have to give you some scientific evidence because I'm talking in a scientific meeting. So these are the two papers which I've quoted. One of the paper at the top end is published a while back now in British Journal of Surgery. And uh, they look at effect of supervised training on outcome after resection of colorectal cancer. So they look at trainees doing the colorectal cancer resection under supervision and the consultants doing them at their own. And the conclusion from that paper was that there is absolutely no difference between the two groups, provided they are very closely supervised. So there is an evidence back in 2005. I think this is a paper from Sydney, Les, Les Bouquet unit, who published that. The second paper is an English paper which came from north of the country. And they look at involvement of surgical trainees in surgery for colorectal cancer and their effect on clinical outcomes. So effectively both have got the similar sort of question to answer and they both have the same conclusion that there was no difference in clinical outcome provided the trainees were supervised. This is, this is one of the paper which I thought had quite a big impact. This is a urology paper published a while back to look into modular training, you know, where you divide the operation in individual modules, which I discussed yesterday maybe module one, two, and three, and they train people in each module rather than giving them the whole operation in one go. And they 
thought and they in their sort of study were able to demonstrate that even a novice laparoscopic surgeon were able to do this safely adopting a modular surgical training. This is a, a Japanese study in pediatric surgery, similar sort of message. So the message is very simple. As long as you are supervised, as long as you are taught properly, you have no impact on the training. Th this, this is a paper which was quoted yesterday. They look at effect of supervision on mentored and expert. Mentored are the people who were trained by their uh, supervisors and experts are the people who do not need any more supervision. They are doing things at their own. And they look at conversions, complications, and astomotic leak and mortality. This is laparoscopic colorectal surgery. And you can see that there is no difference between the two, provided people are mentored. Now, if, if, I've, if I've not been able to sort of convince you in the room after showing you all these slides that having a teacher or being taught properly is a good idea, then if you remember yesterday I showed you a slide of a bull. This is what happened when you have no teacher. This would hopefully uh, would make my case stronger. So, in fact, my is very good. Okay. Now, this is a video which I really don't know why I have to show this. Some of you in course may have seen this. This is a complication talk I gave. And it would just give you an idea of from being an expert in one minute, you can look like a novice in another minute in surgery. This is an anterior resection done in 2004 when I was a trainee. I was a camera person. That's why I've got the video of this. Done by a very experienced surgeon. They used to take IMA with ligature device, which is perfectly safe. Lots of people do that. And there were about 20 people in the audience from Spain who had come to witness this. And everybody was very happy up until this point. So he had a bit of a bleeding, then it stopped. And Professor Heal was commentating as a moderator on the other side. He said, this is a fantastic device. You can control bleeding and be carried on. See if I could speed this up. Uh, maybe it is easier if I leave it because then you can see. I would like you to just concentrate here in this base. Just keep your eye around here. So somebody was asking me today how long the IMA stump we should leave. You know, and it started now. So this is a live surgery, this is not uh, animated or whatever, and this is a demonstration surgery. And, and usually when this happens, everybody becomes very quiet in theatre, nobody talks. And I would like you to just sort of see, now the surgeon have got the control, he asked for a clip. So now they are looking for metal clips and he do the suction. People who are surgeon in this room, you know, they would very easily recognize these times. You know, we all are being there. We all have difficulty. You know, watch this. So he put a clip. And then he realized that he has to load it. He doesn't know how to put the clip because he's never used this before. So now he got it. He clipped it and watch what happened. So he's managed to lock his hemolock or his uh, grasper in the clip. So both things are locked now. And then it starts again. When the clip comes back, it starts again. What do you think will happen here? Any idea? <laughs> right, okay. So at least this was arterial bleeding. You have idea where it's coming from. I, I always look at this video and I, I always praise the cameraman because I was the cameraman as a resident. Because with all this bleeding, because with all this bleeding, there is not a blood on the camera. 
<laughs> anyway, so he put a swap there, he gets the control back. <coughs> and at this stage, uh, Professor Bill Heal, who was moderator on the other side, start talking about it is always very brave to do a conversion for the right reason. And if you make a conversion, we will all understand. And actually, the, the operating surgeon wants somebody to say, please convert. <laughs> anyway, I, I wanted to sort of show you the whole clip so you get an idea of what he did in the end. So he controlled it this time. This time, this time he knows how to apply the clip, where, which angle it should come in. He goes in. not through the, and then he just apply it. And then it stops. The idea really is, it's about being familiar with things. You know, that's what I was trying to say to you. So when you do things, you need to know how the system works, how this clip works, how this instrument works. So you need to be familiar to achieve what you want to do. Now, coming back to, um, Modular training, this is the paper we published from our unit in World Journal of Surgery. We adopted the same modular training approach in colorectal surgery. And we were able to show that there is no difference in terms of clinical outcome for trainees doing this in number of variables. These are the two modules in right hemicolectomy. And then this is the left hemicolectomy or a sigmoid colectomy modular approach. I have shown you this slide yesterday. 235 cases, and you can see total number performed, no difference in conversion rate and clinical outcome, whether trainees do it or the consultant surgeon do it. Now, I have shown you this slide yesterday. When we look at the level of the trainees, you know, resident versus consultants in one year, similar number of cases, almost similar outcome. So people say to me, it is all okay when they work with you. You know, when I tell Taz or Danilo, you know, cut hair or Constantinos today, you know, go there. It's okay, it looks good. But what happens when they go to their hospital and they become independent consultants? Are they able to do the same things? So this is the data from three of my trainees who became consultants and they work in different parts of England now. I asked them to collect data and send it back to us. 235 cases, 6% conversion rate, good R0 resection, morbidity, mortality, and length of stay is comparable to the time when they were with me. So the idea really is that they were not able to learn, but also able to reproduce the same thing when they went away and did the operation themselves. Very quickly, I just give you an idea of how the training works in England. You have beginner, advanced, competent, and proficient trainees. It takes one to two years. Uh, you can't see very well, but at the bottom end there, this is a gas form and the sign-off process. This is within the national training program, how you assess people, how you score people, and how you make them certified competent people in laparoscopy. This is uh, uh, just a copy of a gas form which some of you might be able to see or not. So this is a global assessment score form that we use. And when people are doing things like exposure, theater setup, patient positioning, safe access, dissection around the vesicle pedicle, and they have a score from one to five, one being very bad, five being excellent. So you can actually score these people on each step of the operation when they do in front of you. So it's a very objective way of assessing people. It doesn't come down to me as an individual say, I don't like him, so I'm not going to pass him. You have to justify how they do it. So this is just the guidance of what I was saying. One is not performed, steps had to be done by the trainer, partly performed, performed with substantial verbal support, performed with minor verbal support, without guidance, and perfect. So this is how you sort of rank people in what they do. 
And by using actually those scores in global assessment sheet, you could actually draft their learning curve or proficiency gain curve, which means how quickly they become competent in doing what they do. And this is what our data suggested from Portsmouth within the National Training Program, that on, a, on an average, it takes around 21 or 20 cases before the curve starts to flatten out for most people. And that's why the magic number of 20 cases come from. You know, how many cases do I need to get trained? You say 20. So this is the reason why on average. Of course, some people do it quicker, some people take it longer. But actually, what you can do by using this score sheet is to have a curve data for each step. So you could see here, for example, theta setup and anastomosis is very easy for people to become good at because they're colorectal surgeon, they know how to do it, they become very good. You know, the curve flat out very quickly. And the most difficult in this is splenic flexure. Splenic flexure mobilization is the most difficult within this cohort. And we all know that splenic flexure could be a difficult thing to do. Then you can compare trainees. You, know, you can compare who is at the curve sooner than others. This is four trainees from Portsmouth. This guy became proficient very, very quickly. This guy took more than 21 cases as indicated. So this is a, a very valuable tool to progress to monitor the progress of your trainees and a subjective way of assessing them to tell you how good or bad somebody is progressing. Because the most difficult thing as a trainer is to tell your trainee that you can't do it, you're not good at it. So you have to make sure that you have objective assessment before you go. And then once they have done 20 cases, they were asked to submit two DVDs of independent operation without the trainer being there and they were sent for independent assessment blindly by two assessors and they have to give pass or fail based on the assessment of videos. Right now, this is one of uh, our paper published in Annals of Surgery in 2010 because everybody said that laparoscopy is good for fit patient, you know, quick operation is good. But if you are old, frail, you have multiple comorbidity, it's always best to do a quick open right hemicolectomy or anterior resection because laparoscopy is a problem for head down and four hours and five hours. So we thought we would look at outcome for high risk patient and see if we could compare them with open surgery. So it's a two year data, 2006, 2008. And with high risk, we meant people like these people who had age of 80 years and more, ASA grade three or four, preoperative radiotherapy, and pathological response, pathologically staged T3 and T4 lesions. And they are colon and rectum both. They are not rectal cancers alone. What we looked at, we looked at length of stay, readmission rate, major post-op complications, reoperation rates after surgery, and post-operative mortality, 31 days. So you can see that in those two years when we were looking at, in our centers, we did 224 laparoscopic operations, 200 open operations. They are done for cancers. And then you can see that although it is not a randomized controlled trial, but the group are very evenly matched. Even in terms of T4 staging, they are very similar, rectum. So we were not doing easy cases in laparoscopic arm. That's what I was trying to sort of allude or the data showed. And of those people, people who fulfilled the criteria of high risk were 134 in open arm and 146 in laparoscopic arm. And again, they are very, very similar in terms of percentages between the two group. So this is uh, the outcome of the data. Median length of stay, laparoscopic high risk patient four days, open operation 11 days, high readmission rate in laparoscopy, post-op mortality less than 1%, 2%, post-op complications again very, very small in laparoscopic arm. These are the reason why they had complication requiring further surgery. Only two patients in 146 and they were for port site hernia and prolapse stoma requiring a revision. 
So we were able to show in this data that high-risk patients have got significantly lower post-op morbidity than high-risk open patients. So even in high-risk patients, laparoscopy is a better operation to do. Thank you very much. I think I'm finished here because you're all asleep. <laughs> Thank you.